Hey, fish friends. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for clicking on our poll. Uh, before you continue to scroll down and complete this survey, we wanted to spend a couple more minutes diving deeper into some questions and topics that were brought up at the end of our last Zoom call on Tuesday. Uh, so stick around, this video shouldn't be too long, uh, but it will definitely help you understand, better understand the evolution and diversity of fishes. Awesome, so this first topic here is the power of fins for locomotion. You'll remember that we spent a lot of time talking about what defines a fish, and you explored this question even more with your species design projects that you just turned in. And one of those defining features of fish that we talked about was this um, was the fact that all fish in both freshwater and seawater environments have fins and they rely on these fins for locomotion. But the way that they use their fins will vary widely. So if you look at the Siamese fighting fish on the very right side, you'll see that they use their fins to swim through the water column. And that's when you think of a stereotypical fish, that's probably what you imagine fish using their fins for. And it's true, a lot of fish do use their fins in this way. But then what about a green moray eel? So you'll see that if you look at the, the middle picture here, that they don't have um, the larger pectoral and pelvic fins that you might see in the Siamese fighting fish. However, they do have this modified long and continual dorsal fin along the top and caudal fin by the tail that they use to move themselves through the water. So even though they might not have the fins that you might imagine when you think of a fish, this, these elongated fins are essential for helping eels move through the water and um, continue to swim. But even given that, not all fish can swim. Um, Instead, they might walk, such as this frogfish on the very left side. So frogfish is a very interesting fish. It's part of the anglerfish family, and it lives on the ocean floor, at the very bottom of the ocean. Um, so this fish, even though it doesn't swim and it walks instead, it is still using its fins to walk. So the big takeaway here is that all fish rely on fins for locomotion. However, locomotion does not necessarily equal swimming. So the, what looks like legs on this frogfish are actually its fins that it's using to help it move. Yeah, so fish are very diverse. Um, this is just one crazy example of how, uh, how varied fish can be. And um, this is a, a Great segue into the next part of this document right here. Um, the second topic that we really want to dive deeper into is um, how fish interact with the world. Um, so if you were able to be part of last Tuesday's Zoom call or if you watched the recording, you should be able to recognize that fish do in fact hear, taste, smell, and see. Uh, but what about the two other sensory systems that fish have? Uh, being underwater has led some fish to rely on sensory mechanisms and sensory systems that terrestrial animals do not have. Uh, the lateral line system and the ampullae of Lorenzini are two systems that fish have adapted to have and use for their advantage, uh, which we did get to explore a bit in our last call. Um, but what about echolocation? Um, the question here is, do fish use echolocation? Um, the answer is fish do not. They're not able to use echolocation themselves, but that doesn't mean that they aren't part of a system that does. Fish are part of a prey-predator relationship with cetaceans, which are whales and dolphins, that use echolocation to find fish. Um, whales and dolphins use echolocation to see with sound. Um, so we all know that fish have swim bladders. These swim bladders are filled with air as they help the fish regulate buoyancy in the water column. This air-filled bubble acts as a great resonating chamber for sound waves to bounce back uh, from echolocation sources. So whales and dolphins will send out these high-pitched echoes through the water column and they will continue to travel through the water until it reaches an object. And the ocean is filled with a lot of different things, a lot of different objects and rocks and coral reefs and fish. So those sound waves do come back to them and they're 
they're able to receive all this information with echolocation. And they're able to distinguish a sound wave bouncing back from a fish because of the swim bladder. The sound waves will travel through the fish and uh, spend some time in the swim bladder before going back to the dolphin or the whale. And that sound wave will have the highest contrast compared to all the other objects in the ocean that might bounce back sound waves to the cetacean. And um, swim bladders, if you remember, can vary among fish. We have two different types of swim bladders, closed and open, but they also vary based on the size and species of fish. So the difference in these swim bladders will ultimately change the way that sound waves from echolocation will go back to the cetacean. It changes the way that it will travel back. And so cetaceans are really good at being able to decipher this information. They're so good at this that they are able to determine what type of species fish are, even though they're not in front of them. So in conclusion, fish aren't able to use echolocation themselves, but echolocation is used on them. And they're able, whales and dolphins are able to use echolocation on fish because of their swim bladder. Awesome. So then the last thing that we wanted to talk about was this question of can fish see in color? And the overwhelming answer to that is yes, they can. Uh, color vision evolved in fish about 300 million years ago, and as a result, it is widely seen in fish in many different environments. And if, as you can imagine, just from our own experience with color vision, um, color vision is very advantageous for fish because it allows them to discriminate um, between different uh, organisms in their environment. It allows them to better make out the environment around them. So they use color vision in a lot of ways similar to how we would. That being said, that doesn't necessarily mean that fish have the same experience with color vision that we, we do. So for example, some fish may have color vision that is more skewed for one part of the light spectrum than another. Like for example, in this second picture here, um, some fish may see um, reds and purples more prominently than other colors, whereas other fish might see blues and greens more prominently. And then if we go down to the very last two pictures here, um, some fish may even see more than just color vision. So if you look at the picture on the um, on your left hand side, that is infrared vision, and that is seen in a few a few species of fish, a few kinds of fish, but it's not very widespread. Um, for example, though, salmon live in both freshwater and seawater environments, and they can see in color, uh, not as well as humans can, but they still can. And they have also um, evolved the ability over time to basically switch on infrared vision. They have a special enzyme that can be activated to allow them to see infrared, which is really, really cool. The reason why this is helpful for them is when they're spending time in freshwater environments, oftentimes the freshwater environments that they're swimming through have very high levels of turbidity. As you remember from last week, that means that the water is very murky. And so infrared still allows them to sense prey and predators as they're swimming through these very um, cloudy environments that color vision probably wouldn't be too helpful for. The last point that we want to make is there are cases in a few different kinds of fish where their color vision is really not that great. Um, so for example, in sharks, sharks do not have very many cells in their eyes that allow them to sense color. And so they end up basically being colorblind. Um, at least we believe them that we believe based on the evidence that we have right now that they're most likely colorblind. So their vision would look like what you see on the right hand side. However, because they're, even though their visual, um, their ability to see color with their visual system is compromised, that is okay with the, with the case of sharks, because as you remember from last week, they have the ability to sense electric fields through their electroreceptors. And for sharks, this ability actually works out really, really well because sharks hunt between dusk and dawn, so they're most active at night. 
that's a time when color vision probably wouldn't be too helpful for them. But with electroreception, they're still able to sense prey very, very quickly and very, very easily because they're very sensitive even to muscle contractions and prey. They can sense that with their electroreceptors. The other thing that um, electroreceptors really help sharks with is migration and, and homing through around the world. They're able to sense the electromagnetic magnetic field um, around the earth and they use that to aid them in migration. So that is our deep dive for today. Um, and we have a couple of, of questions in the poll that address some of the things that we brought up. And um, I hope this was helpful. All right, bye everyone. Bye everyone.